If the scientific evidence leads us to put a little different interpretation on the Bible that is consistent with the rest of the Bible, I believe that's a reasonable thing to do. Hello again, we're back. And if you just got done listening to the discussion that we had about science, scripture, faith, we're gonna move that more into the area of the age of the earth. These two have differing positions. Doug Brown to my right is going to be representing a young earth position. Mike Edinburgh to my left is going to be representing an old earth position. And if you did listen to the previous section, these guys are in pretty well agreement about how to think through these things. They both want to honor scripture and science. They both want to show the world that science demonstrates the existence of God. So in this portion, it's going to be a little more formal. Not just a spontaneous discussion, although that was fun. We're going to try things a little more debate-oriented. And we'll have each representative talk about their position for roughly five minutes. And then I'll have some questions for each. Each question is kind of geared toward one position or the other. A short response for one side, and then the other side will have the chance to respond to the response. And then, really looking forward to just sitting back and watching these guys go at it with cross-examination. The opportunity to ask questions of the other, and then they'll have the opportunity to respond briefly to the other person's responses. And then we'll have the summary. You get to summarize your position again, why your position still stands strong, or even bring up the entire summary of the discussion and the debate portion. And after that, we'll come back together, we'll reunite, we'll leave the debating sphere, and we'll talk about maybe the single best evidence and what you want to leave listeners with. If you could talk to a classroom full of UNM students, what's the evidence of God from science that you'd want to leave them with? So that'll kind of be the format. So, Doug Brown, representing the Young Earth position, why don't you present your position? Okay. Well, as I said in the previous podcast, I believe that the Bible is true and it should be taken as literally as it can be. So I read Genesis as a historical account of what God did and how he created the earth. But there are several things that I've learned. And in fact, I did take a more of an old earth creationist viewpoint for a long time because I assumed that what I was being told by science was true. Namely, that they had shown and had hard evidence that the earth was old and the universe is even older. And so I assumed, well, if they know what they're talking about, then I have to interpret the Bible based upon that. I've discovered that there is a great deal of evidence that the earth is young. Some things you wanted to bring up a little later on are are some of the things that I can resonate on, but there are assumptions that, that things are old. But when you look at the earth, you look at the rocks, how do you know how old the rock is? It doesn't have any message etched in it that says created in 451 million BC or something. It has no age associated with it. The only way you can figure out age is based upon circumstances. And so a lot of times uh, scientists will throw up radiological, radiometric dating as the way they know the rocks are so old. But you can get very different answers. There are many different radioisotopes. And so you have to pick which radioisotope you're going to use to measure the age of a rock. And you have to make assumptions about how much of the respective isotopes were present in the rock when it initially formed and decay rates and things like that. You make several assumptions in order to come up with the age of a rock. One thing that opened my eyes was when I was listening to a speaker and he said that there was a form they had to fill out to get the radiometric dating of rock. But one of the things they had to put on the form was, what age do you think it is? What age do you expect it to be? Well, that's open to being fudged because you found a certain dinosaur fossil in that rock. And then those dinosaurs are purported to have existed 160 million years ago. Then they're going to look for a radiometric dating method, of which there are many, that confirms the age you gave them. So I don't think there's that much objectivity in the radiometric dating as much as people want to hang their hat on it. So I've told several people this. When you ask how old the rock is, they'll say it's an old rock. How do you know? Because there are old fossils in it. And you say, how do you know how old those fossils are? You wait a while and ask somebody else so they don't know what you asked the first time. And they say, well, they're old fossils because they're in old rocks. And you can get into a very circular argument there. The fact is, I just don't believe that people know exactly how old things are. That it's more, there's a narrative that's been developed about the age of the earth. And they're just being consistent with their narrative. 
There's things like Mount St. Helens and the erosion that occurred when there was an eruption there, there was a lake or something formed, and then it broke loose and washed through a canyon, and it created a canyon that was about a tenth the height of, I think, the Grand Canyon Walls, something like that. And it created that in a matter of a few hours. Well, you go to the Grand Canyon and they say, well, it took millions of years. Well, we know that to create something on a, say, a 10% scale of that took hours. So it's not necessarily true that the Grand Canyon is millions of years old, but that's just an assumption that's been made. So there's so many things like that that have come up. When people tell me they know the Earth is old, I just tend to be skeptical that the evidence really proves that it's old. And consequently, since I tend to take a literal view of the scriptures uh, as much as I can, I think it's thousands of years old, not millions. That's how I come up with my position. And we'll talk about some more evidences, I think, as we go a little further. All right. Thanks, Doug. Uh, now, Mike, a five-minute opening for you. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say that I firmly believe that God created everything and that Jesus Christ is both Savior and Lord. But I believe that there is good evidence for an old earth. And I like to categorize that into some different ones. The first one is layers, because those are kind of easy to understand. First of all, there are tree rings, and tree ring dating can take things back about 12,000 years, which I think may be a little bit earlier than the young earth community mm -hmm. believes the earth is old. There's the Green River Shale deposits. Those are very interesting from up in Utah. These are deposits that were laid down in very calm lakes. They're very thin layers. We believe they're annual layers because they go pollen, no pollen, pollen, no pollen, pollen, no pollen, about seven million times. And so I think the best explanation of that is that they were laid down over seven million years. There are coral reefs that, because of the strata in them, they have growth rings that turn out to be millions to hundreds of millions of years old. There's one very interesting one that is geologically determined to be 500 million years old, but also they show some daily growth bands in an annual growth band, and there were something like 400 days in an annual growth band, meaning that the Earth was going a little bit faster then. And it turns out that the Earth is slowing down. I think it's about 15 microseconds per year. If you take that back to where you have a day that's only 20 hours long instead of 24, and the difference in time, you can estimate then that the Earth has been slowing down from that coral leaf for about 500 million years. So the geological time and the time based on the Earth's slow down rate are the same. So you have two independent measurements, so to speak, in the same coral reef that give you the same results that that coral reef is 500 million years old. Hmm. So that's layers. Radiological dating. I think that in general radiological dating is very good and there are about six different radiological methods that they've used to date some rocks in Greenland and they all come out to be oh about 3.6 billion years old with all six different measurements. Now there are some mistakes you can make in radiological measurements for time and one that I think the, the young earth community likes to use is potassium argon dating. And they say that, well, there was an eruption in Hawaii where people saw it about 100 years ago, but it's been dated by potassium argon to, I think, several million to possibly a few hundred million years old. The problem is, is that saying that you're getting inconsistent results for that is that you can't use potassium argon to measure anything less than several million years old. It's kind of like measuring a micron with a yardstick. So saying that it's inconsistent, but not acknowledging that it's an inappropriate use of that dating method, I think is incorrect. So anyway, radiological dating, I think, seems to work very well. So I would say that the evidence that the Earth is old is really very strong. But now we have to deal with how do we interpret Genesis. And I think I said a little bit about this earlier, and that is that uh, Genesis 1 has poetic elements, and I think we can use those to give us a little bit different than a historical, literalistic meaning. This idea that on the first three days God created things to provide for day four, five, and six is another interpretation for Genesis that fits in with an old earth interpretation. Hmm. All right, thanks, Mike and Doug, for your openings. I'm going to go into some moderator questions here. First one is directed toward the young Earth position, so Doug. Distant starlight has been a difficulty for young Earth creationism. With parallax trigonometry, we're able to look at stars that are apparently billions of light years away, so the light would have taken several billion years to reach us, implying, we would think, an older Earth, an Earth that has been here at least long enough for that starlight to reach us. So how do you respond to that? 
Yeah. Well, I would refer you to a book and a video produced by Russell Humphreys, a PhD physicist at Los Alamos, called Starlight and Time. When I saw that, it explained to me how Einstein's theory of general relativity can explain some vast differences in time between what's going on at the center of the universe versus what's going on at the periphery of the universe. And he showed that because in his theory, the universe was created by God on the fourth day in terms of the stars and the galaxies, etc. And they were much closer together than they are now. Now, close is relative. It's maybe a billion light years across instead of 100 billion light years across or whatever, but small enough so the gravitational effects of the universe on the Earth could have caused the clocks on the Earth to run slow by many orders of magnitude, so that six days on the Earth could be equivalent to even billions of years out on the periphery. And that would explain how we got the difference because time is not a constant. Time is dependent on, upon gravity. Now, one thing that, that Humphreys mentioned as an argument of the Big Bang proponents is that the universe doesn't have any special places, that the Earth couldn't be at the center of the universe. And we have to assume that the Earth is at no special place. He also presented a lot of evidence through a thing called quantized redshifts, that in fact, as we look out into the universe, we appear to be relatively close to the center of the universe. And if, in fact, we were moved off to the side by a billion light years, we couldn't be seeing the quantized redshift effects the way we're seeing them here on the Earth. So just the combination of those two things, that we can explain how the Earth does appear to be near the center, and at the center, gravitational effects can account for big time differences. And that's why I'm willing to assume that the Earth itself is young in terms of our clocks on the Earth, whereas the clocks out there in the distant galaxies may be moving at a much faster rate. Mike, do you have a response? Relativistic arguments are very interesting. I've studied a little bit about special relativity and some about general. But the one thing that is clear is that two observers in different reference frames are going to see the same event. Like, for example, if you have a car crash in one reference frame, you're not going to see them miss each other in a different reference frame. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have two reference frames where clocks are running at different speeds, and we're talking about the Earth. And so in, say, the time of creation, say six 24-hour days, both observers would see the Earth revolving around the sun much less than one revolution, much less than a year, because there are only six days. Mm -hmm. What would an observer in a different reference frame see? Well, his time might be different, but he's still going to see the Earth revolving around the sun for a very small fraction of a year. So I'm saying that there is no way that you can confuse an Earth that is billions of years old with one that's only six or seven days old because of relativistic arguments. All right, question two is going to be directed toward Mike in the old Earth position regarding the water-based deposits like the ocean salinization, the Mississippi River Delta, things like that, or Niagara Falls. It looks like it's only been pulled back a pretty short space if it's been there for millions of mm -hmm. years. We have issues of weathering that would make it look like the water has been having its effect for a relatively short period of time. Seems like a difficulty for an old Earth position. Do you have a response to that? Well, I think there are several parts of that question. One is the buildup of river deltas. And in fact, river deltas in our large rivers like the Mississippi and the Nile have very thick deposits, several thousand feet thick. But the earth is changing over time. Continents are rising. The seabeds are sometimes falling, particularly in deltas where you have the extra weight of the sediment that causes the seabed to fall a little bit. And then you have plate tectonics that is always moving material around. Those two things can explain very well what we see in our river deltas today in terms of sediment. Okay, salt in the ocean. There are biological and chemical means where the salt would precipitate out to the seafloor and recycle through plate tectonics. And so there is no problem with an old earth and the amount of salt in the sea. As far as Niagara Falls go, I'm not familiar with the geology or that argument. Specifically, I don't really know. I suspect it might have something to do with the fact that the earth's surface is changing. All right, Doug, do you have a response to Mike's position? Yeah, I don't know how plate tectonics totally accounts for what Mike is saying. Not an expert on that either. Back to the flood, which I think we all assume is a fairly recent event in terms of thousands of years. 
that would have involved major movement of tectonic plates, etc. And that would have, I think, set the baseline for what we see in the oceans. And if that is the case, then I would expect that the deposition of sediment, say from the Mississippi River into the Delta, that that would have all occurred since the flood. That the flood kind of washed everything clean and started over again. The view I take is it's a fairly recent event. And if, in fact, the Mississippi River had been flowing at that silt rate for millions of years, the Gulf of Mexico would be full of mud. Russ Humphreys came and talked to us at Sandia about that one time, and he said he'd done the calculations and the silt flow rate the Army Corps of Engineers developed. He says there's not enough mud in the Gulf to account for that. So I tend to take that as an argument that's pretty easy to understand. All right, third mm-hmm. question. That's going to bounce back to the young Earth position. Well, some say that God would be deceptive to create a world with the appearance of age and that it would be difficult to trust a God like this. How do you respond to that? Yeah. Well, I tend to see God as sovereign, so I wouldn't want to second-guess him on whether he decided to make it look old or not. My real response to this is, how do you know something looks old? I mean, that's a preconceived notion. You know, we look at a rusted-out hulk of a boat, and we say it's old, but we mean it's decades old, not millions of years old. So I don't think there is any real baseline we've got to say that, well, those rocks look old. We really don't know their age. We're told fossils are very old. They take a long time to form. And we've seen cases where fossils have formed in a matter of, I think, weeks or months, uh, certainly a matter of years. I remember seeing a picture of a fossilized roll of fence wire that had been dumped into the ocean just off the coast of Australia. And they'd found it later. And it was pure fossil. Well, we know fence wire of that type wasn't produced less than about 100 years before. So it couldn't be millions of years old. So we know that fossils can form relatively quickly. Consequently, I kind of question why people can look and say, well, these fossils had to be millions of years old, that they could have been very young. The the thing that's required for fossilization seems to be having the right chemicals in solution to act on something. And so they've talked about having fossilized hats and teddy bears and things, (laughs) which are very recent objects, and yet they can fossilize quickly. Mike, you have a response? I guess that's one of the possibilities that people have brought up is that uh, God created the earth with the appearance of age. Clearly, I don't think that that is the case. It's real age. But I think that the argument that God is trying to fool us, of course, is a bad argument. We were having a young earth, old earth debate at one time, and one person says, well, we were all created just 10 seconds ago with all these memories put into our minds. (laughs) An interesting thing. Anyway, fossilization. I suspect that wire getting fossilized, that's a little strange because my idea of fossilization is where the material itself is replaced by minerals. Does wire do that? It looked like it. Maybe it was a big roll of minerals. I can understand some kind of a crust forming around it. Anyway, the, the fossil record that we have, what is underlying it is radiological dating. And all of the strata that the fossils are in have been radiologically dated, and that's the basis. And it's not like a circular argument where we think the fossils lived at a certain time and then we see them and therefore they lived that. That's not the case. The fossil record dates have been established by radiological dating. And then once that is established, you can use the particular type of animals that are in the strata to get a rough idea of the age of the strata. All right, got question four now for the old earth position. Mike, some call 13.7 billion years of planetary development and three-ish billion years of biological development unnecessary and a waste for a maximally resourceful God. How do you respond to that? (laughs) Well, a lot of things. First of all, 13 billion years that was about the time of the, what they call the Big Bang, and that as the universe expanded and cooled, much later, stars started forming. So the Earth would only be like three or four billion years old. But anyway, why did God take so long? Why did God create dinosaurs? Some people would say, well, perhaps God was experimenting, and he kind of had an idea of what he had in mind, but he didn't quite get it right, and so he had to keep changing things. I don't believe that for a minute. I think that God was doing it just the way he wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. I believe that God enjoys at least two things. One is I think he enjoys process, because we see that a lot of the things that he's created, there's a process that plays out. And I think the other thing is he enjoys variety, lots of different things. I mean, we look at the butterflies that we have today and all the different varieties of butterflies. Why do we have that many butterflies? I mean, we certainly don't need that many butterflies. I think it's because God enjoys variety. Look at all the people we have, quite a variety of people. I think it's because God enjoys it, not because he made some kind of mistake and has had to sequentially correct it over time. 
I would agree with Mike on that answer, really. We probably agree that God could have created the universe instantaneously, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. So it's just a matter of question. How did he do it? Did he do it quickly? Did he do it slowly? But my view of God is that I'm not one to question him anyhow. That In his sovereignty, he can decide whether he wants to create the earth slowly or create it quickly. So I'm not going to accuse him of being wasteful if he did take a long time. It just doesn't matter to me. It's his prerogative. All right, you guys are being way too nice to each other. Let's heat <laughs> things up a little more. <laughs> no, that was a very nice response. It was cool to hear the level of agreement. We're going to move into the cross-examination, though, so now is your chance to ask difficult questions of each other. So I'm going to start with Mike from the Old Earth position. He'll ask Doug five questions. I have several questions here. First question, Doug, is how does the young Earth view explain the marine fossils at the top of Sandia Crest? I would assume, first of all, there seem to be limestone deposits on the top of lots of mountains. I tend to explain that through Noah's flood, that during the flood of Noah, that I don't think it rained enough to cover the mountains. I don't think you'd get that much rain. But I think the tectonic plates shifted and dropped. And so the things that were high lowered themselves. And I remember in my encyclopedia when I was a kid, a picture showed land and then above it at least a mile of water. And it said if all of the land on the earth were flattened, that it would be covered by over a mile of water. So there's plenty of water to cover the earth if we just lowered the mountains and raised the bottom of the sea. So when all that happened, I do believe there was a sea and that the limestone deposits occurred during Noah's flood. Okay, so it sounds to me like you're saying that at the time of the flood, the earth was fairly flat to allow the water to cover everything. But but there were mountains because the Bible says there were mountains. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Uh-huh. But the mountains could have dropped in level some. So some mountains rose and some came down? Yeah. Well, you know, that's my view also, <laughs> but not during the flood. Oh, okay. And I think the difference is I would attribute a lot of the tectonic movement to the flood itself. Mm -hmm. You may view it differently. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The Institute of Creation Research says that radioactive decay accelerated during the flood. And that was a book by de Young, Thousands, Not Billions. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with the idea that radioactive decay accelerated during the flood? I don't know. They seem to claim to have evidence that radioactive decay has changed, that it hasn't been a constant over time. And if they have the evidence, I'm willing to accept it. I haven't researched that well enough to be able to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Would you say the laws of physics would have to change to allow that to happen? Maybe. That's what I didn't understand about their argument. I don't know that all the physical processes have to be invariant. That might be one that can vary. We don't even know what causes some radioactive decay. There's something weird that goes on in a nucleus and it decides to eject some protons or neutrons. And so I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't mean this to be argumentative, but why do young earth creationist proponents focus on Genesis 1 and not so much on the rest of the Bible? Hmm. Well, Genesis 1 is what talks about creation for Mm -hmm. the most part. I don't know. I, I certainly believe the whole rest of the Bible. In fact, to come back to that, one of my reasons for taking Genesis 1 fairly literally is that the rest of the Bible has been pressed pretty hard in terms of archaeology. So much of what has been recorded in the Bible has been shown to be historically accurate and places referred to have been discovered. So I say, well, if the Bible is accurate in those respects, I'll believe that it's accurate on Genesis 1. That's the story of creation. So when we talk creation, that's where I go. Mm Mm-hmm. So I talked earlier about the 7 million layers of the Green River Shale deposits with alternating pollen and no pollen. How would a a young earth view explain that? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question because I wasn't aware of that particular Ah. phenomenon. I can answer it a different way in that there were assertions that the ice layers on Greenland were so old based upon the layers and the assumption that there was a layer of snow laid down once a year. Well, they found that that was not an accurate assumption here after World War II. It may have been decades after. They found some World War II planes that had crashed on Greenland. And the drilling down through the snow, the cores, whatever they found, layers of snow, would have said they were like 300 years old. And they were well known to be only 30 or 40. So the answer was that there wasn't just one layer a year laid down in the snow. There were several layers per year. So to come back to your question, I wonder if it's possible that pollen could be emitted many times a year. And so it's not just a matter of one layer means one year. It could be many, many layers per year. Yeah, I think that today it's emitted pretty much one time in the year. But Eh, who knows? It's a good question. 
So the fossil record shows different strata with different kinds of animals in the different strata. In other words, you find what they think of as ancient marine animals like trilobites in the bottom layer, but in upper layers you find more modern animals like mammoths and all that. It's orderly. You don't have a lot of crossing over of fossils in the different strata. How would a young earth explanation of that go? I haven't really studied this detail very much recently, but Back to Noah's flood, when the flood occurred, I can see where different animal types might have been killed during the flood at different points in time. The sea creatures could have been buried very easily by an underwater landslide or volcanic eruption. Something could have covered them up and the more advanced animals were climbing to higher ground. There are many evidences of dinosaurs. I mean, this is groups of dinosaurs leaving tracks there as they apparently were trying to escape something. In Australia, that's particularly true. It's one area. They even seem to have been maybe half floating, and so their feet were brushing against the bottom. The tracks were fossilized, which has to happen very quickly. you got to cover the tracks up before they erode and disappear. So there is evidence, and again, I haven't studied the details to give you a really good answer on that one. But the fact is, Noah's flood can account for a lot of the things that we find in the fossil records. One example, there's some trees that were buried upright, and they penetrated through several layers of rock, which you'd say, how did that happen over millions of years? Well, it probably didn't. Somehow, many layers of rock formed in a very short time and buried these trees. So the rock layers weren't necessarily laid down just slowly.